John in his, his inspired and expert writing did this thing where he sets everything up against a backdrop of two powerful opposites and then brings out one powerful truth. There's other truths in there, but two opposites, one big truth. And if you look at this chapter that we prayed through in this morning and talked a lot about it, and it was interesting how it fit into your uh, study uh, in, in, the, um, in, in the fellowship study too, the two opposites we're dealing with is a selfless path versus a self path. I'm not even saying selfish or self-centered. I'm just going to say a self path. Selfless, self path. And then the big truth, there's a powerful truth about Jesus in this. But let me tell you this, the big powerful truth is not really Jesus, it's Jesus pointing to something about you. And that will be the powerful truth when we get there. Well, what am I saying here? Well, you'll notice there's three uh, individuals up there on the screen, and that's it. Uh, Mike was so relieved, he came in, I said, Mike, one slide, and then it's an auto forward anyway. And so he was, there it is, because that's the whole sermon. That's the whole chapter. That's the whole lesson God has for you today. It, it revolves around these three individuals. All we're going to do is dig into the background because as John is, there's just a whole lot of ancient Jewish stuff going on. So let me just start off reading the first of the chapter. Now before the feast of the Passover, when Jesus knew that his hour had come to depart, out of this world to the Father, having loved his own who were in the world, he loved them to the end. During supper, when the devil had already put it into his heart, into the heart of Judas Iscariot, Simon's son, to betray him, Jesus, knowing that the Father had given all things into his hand and that he had come from God and was going back to God, rose from the supper. Here we go. This is where it really starts. He laid aside his outer garments and taking a towel, tied it around his waist. Then he poured water into a basin and began to wash the disciples' feet and to wipe them with the towel that was wrapped around him. Interesting for those of us that were in this, we've gone from one meal to another. Have you noticed? Chapter 12 was, the setting was what? A meal. It was uh, outside of Jerusalem in the suburbs, about two miles outside of town. Now we're inside Jerusalem. We're at another meal. And the big thing about these meals is that in that Middle Eastern culture, a lot of things happened around meals. Kind of like here. When you sit down, you're doing some serious friendship stuff going on around a meal. So not surprising, the meals are going on. And there's this thing with water. Uh, the Islamic religion still has kind of some um, uh, after ripples of this. Judaism still has it, of course, but back in the day... How this worked was water had a very important place. Remember we talked about the wedding at Cana? And Jesus, everybody remembers where that Jesus turned water into wine there, but where did he get the jars? Do you remember? There were seven of them? Say, yeah. <laughs> Mark's back there. I know, I know. <laughs> Seven jars, okay, and let's help Mark out a little bit with this, and they would be filled with water for what? Ceremonial washing, right, purification. And it was a very practical thing, because anybody who travels or walks on a beach in your flip-flops, or your Crocs, or whatever you happen to wear, knows this, sand gets in your shoes. And you get dirty feet, and if you're coming into someone's house, the part of the ceremonial washing, of course, even entering the house, was to clean off your feet. You had no business walking into somebody's home 
especially if you're invited for a meal, with dirty feet. You cleaned off your feet. But there's a hitch here. Is that cleaning feet, especially in the Middle East, feet have a kind of um, humiliating side to them. For instance, let me give you a travel hack. If you ever go to the Middle East and you're sitting somewhere, don't talk to them with your feet up on the table, with the, your feet facing them. It is about as offensive as you can be. Feet had this place. Now, what would happen then is people would ceremonially clean their feet. And if they were a richer family, they would have slaves to clean their feet. But here is uh, an insight on just how bad this would be or how low a task. If you had a Hebrew slave, no Hebrew should be humiliated to the point of washing someone else's feet. Even a slave, even if you were a slave, that was too humiliating for the slave to do. The only slave that would clean feet would be a Gentile. If you happen to have a Gentile or a non-Jewish slave, you could get them to wash your feet. So I want you to understand that. And here you come into a Passover meal, the meal of meals. And this Messiah that you are following pulls out a bowl fills it with water and puts a towel around his waist and starts washing feet. That is just crazy. That's insane. Nobody does that kind of thing. It's so humiliating that it's just weird. Wow. Verse 14, If I then, your Lord and teacher, have washed your feet, you ought also to wash one another's feet. See, now here it's getting really strange because here you have a Messiah you're following and you're upholding in obedience as, as the word came up today. And he's washing feet. Nobody does that unless they're the lowest of the low. That's really strange. And now he turns around and says, I've done it to you. You have to do it to each other. Wow. Wow first layer of what's being taught here is mind-boggling. I imagine they did not understand at all what was happening until Acts chapter 2 when the Holy Spirit came down is the idea of something we've, in our culture, we label now in the church anyway, the servant leader. The servant leader. You lead by serving. Those who serve the best are actually the leaders. Revolutionary, isn't it? In a, in, even in our culture where if you're a bigwig, um, you know, you're up on the top. You're on the pedestal. No. Jesus says, no, if anything, you're at the bottom of the pedestal. Servant, leader. And he says, this is your example. See, it's not enough to say, wow, isn't that Jesus something? No, no. This is your example. This is what it means to follow me. This is the example of things. And to have that level of a servant's heart is absolutely daunting. It doesn't come natural to anyone, does it? Well, let's dig into the characters a little bit and see why, how, and whether we should even take this seriously. Let's start with good old Peter. I heard, uh, I think, uh, Pastor Steve for the day <laughs> said in there, he said, Peter was your hero because Peter was always up to something. He was always doing something. So here's Peter, and every biblical scholar that I find actually gives good old Peter some, some um, conditional kudos here because at least he's the only one to, to speak up and go, Jesus, this is weird. What are you doing? You can't wash my feet. It's just not appropriate. And he was just pointing out the obvious that everybody else in the room was, was thinking. And then you might look at Jesus' answer and you might even think it's a little harsh, but what, what was he meaning when he answered back Peter? Verse 8, Peter says to him, You shall never wash my feet. And Jesus answered him, If I do not wash you, you have no share with me. 
not only a Peter, please, can I wash your feet? It's if I cannot do this, you have no part of me. Now, if we can go back and think a little ancient Jewish for a bit, this will make sense. Because as I'm just reiterating what I already said, is you didn't go into somebody's home with dirty feet. You washed them off and then you were allowed in their home. This was effectively Jesus. This is the home of Jesus. It's the upper room at the moment. And they're about to have this meal and he's telling Peter, if you don't do this ordinance, if you don't do this thing, you cannot come in my house. Have to wash your feet. And of course, it's taking something literal to point out something that has far, far deeper meaning in the spiritual sense. Now, it would be possible, we're talking about water and dunking feet, you may have went, well, that sounds a lot like baptism. Some people, some people not quite as sharp as Steve, might have went there. And it wouldn't be a bad place to go, it's just we have one problem, and this is going to open up a great lesson for us. Foot washing happened all the time. Right? It was routine. Uh, every day you washed your feet in this way. If it's done right, how many times is a person really baptized uh, in water? Immer you know, I believe it's once, right? It, if it goes according to plan and everything's understood, that's it. It's, and where I'm going with this is, is this, this point, is that the foot washing was a routine basis. Baptism is, is really meant to be a single event. So it doesn't fit perfectly there. So we have to look for something else in all of this. And here's where we would go talking about a spiritual condition relating to what's going on in the, the physical world. Put yourself in dusty old ancient Israel. You're walking with your sandals. Can you go on the beach and walk along the beach and not pick up sand on your feet? Question then, can you go into this world that you guys, man, amazing what you were talking about with where do you get your information and the effect of the world and everything in the class today, can you go in the world and not pick up the dust of the world? No. You can't. Uh, I, I can't, you can't. It's going to get on you. And Jesus is saying, you need a routine. This fits in very well with the, your idea of information that you're in. You need a routine where your feet, your soul is cleansed on a daily basis. So the dust of the world doesn't cling to you. Because every day you don't do it, your feet, your soul, your heart, your core is that much dustier and dirtier. This is where he's going with this whole thing. He has to clean you on a routine basis. He has to clean me on a routine basis. And if he doesn't, you have no business trying to hold a relationship with him because you don't even belong in his house in the most uh, literal and figurative way. We are to be cleansed in order to come into the position of uh, holy relationship. We need the daily cleansing. Now, Peter, this is where I think uh, Steve was going with all of this. Is what Peter would fit in so well with this culture. So he kind of learns his lesson here. Oh, Jesus, you have to clean my feet. Well, then what? Simon Peter said to him, verse 9, Lord, not my feet only, but also my hands and my head. And Jesus said to them, those who ba have ba uh, has bathed does not need to wash except for his feet because they're completely clean. And the idea is the same thing. You can get the idea in the physical sense. If I went home and I bathed properly to go over to your house for this uh, special meal, and I walk over there in my sandals, I'm clean, but my feet probably get dirty on the way over, so you cleanse, you know. And you see it in the spiritual sense that he's telling Peter that he's heard his word, he's believed his word, there's a cleansing that went on within Peter, but he's still picking up the gunk of the world. You don't have to go to one extreme to the other. 
Now, if we had anything that talked about baptism, it would probably, probably be this cleaning that uh, Jesus is talking about here in the form of this bath. If you have bathed, if you have already accepted Christ, if you've already done those things biblically, genuinely, honestly, if you've done those, you don't need to keep taking the bath, what you need to do when you go to a house uh, of the Lord as in the most uh, uh, spiritual sense here, is what you need to do is make sure your feet are clean when you come in. The cleansing the dirt of the world off. Made me think of something I was reading this. When I first um, came into a living relationship with the Lord, I was uh, the, next to the college where I was, there was a really, really happening Wesleyan church. And those are good people. I like Wesleyan people. And in this uh, church, though, Wesleyans are really big on this. Altar calls are a big, big deal for them. And so there would, usually, there would usually be an altar call in every morning service. And there was a young man in there, he was a college-age fellow, and he was, um, he was a serious Wesleyan. He loved the Lord, he tried to do everything right. And it seemed every Sunday you could plan on a man, he'd be up at that altar as if he was you know, doing the sinner's prayer and starting all over again. There he goes again, it's like, the difference between washing your feet and, and getting a power wash. You know, you don't need a power wash all the time. And it was just like back up to the altar, power wash, back to the starting line, starting all over. Here's a problem though, if, if in fact you have sincerely been at the starting line and God has taken you down your path some distance, what happens if on a continual basis you say, oh, I must be wrong, and you go back to the starting line over and over and over again? Well, whatever that distance that you've covered from the starting line, you never get any further. You only get as far as, well, where you stopped and went back to the starting line. There's some point where you say, I messed up, I fell down, Jesus needs to pick me up and he needs to take me from here on. I need to go from here on. And I'll tell you, you see this in churches all the time. You'll find someone who comes somewhere, they'll get to that point where they reach the, a four-year point or a five-year point in, in their where you would expect someone to be in their service and their, how people understand them in a church. And somewhere in there, uh, somewhere at some point, they end up in a disagreement or some kind of challenge they can't face. Boom, they're out of there. They're in another church. Guess what happens? Somewhere around four or five years on, they're out of there and somewhere else. What's happening? They're hitting this, this point on their path going back to the starting line and then going and just traveling because it's comfortable. Those, they know that path for the first uh, three or four years. Jesus is holding you to the path. He is saying, look, you need to clean that dust off that the world will put on you on a daily basis and then keep going. You need to keep moving on. You need to keep growing. That's what's going on with Peter here, and we know that this is going to take Peter eventually up to what happens in Acts. First layer. That's just the first layer. The idea of a servant leader and the idea of what it means to clean your feet. But let's go a little deeper, see... This goes on as well in verse 37. We're still just talking about good old Peter here. Peter said to him, Lord, why can I not follow you now? Because at this point we're further down. Jesus says, where I'm going, you cannot follow this time. You will later on, but you don't even understand. And so Peter says to him, Lord, why can't well, I not follow you now? I will lay down my life for you. Jesus answered, will you lay down your life for me? Truly, truly, I say to you, the rooster will not crow till you have denied me three times. 
So you have Jesus demanding to do this radical servant thing. That's crazy as it is. But to someone he knows is going to deny him. He's going to serve someone he knows is going to turn his back on him. This is getting really kind of crazy, isn't it? Well, if Peter level seems crazy, crazy, let's move on to Judas. Ah, I'm glad, Steve, that I've, you say Peter's my hero. I'm okay with that. I'll be worried when somebody comes in and says Judas is their hero. That, that wouldn't be good. But let's talk about Judas, because see, Jesus went in. How many disciples, how many of his disciples did he wash their feet, or it was at least implied? All of them. Well, guess who that includes? Judas. Judas. Verse 18, I am not speaking of all of you. I know whom I have chosen, but the scripture will be fulfilled. He who ate my bread has lifted his heel against me. I am telling you this now before it takes place, before it takes place, that when it does take place, you may believe that I am he. In other words, the Messiah, no mistakes, I knew it was coming. Back into the traditions for a while in Middle Eastern, we, we talked a little bit about this. But this meal, especially, this is the setter. This is the Passover meal. It's the close friends that are in this meal. You just, it's an honor to be invited by someone to this meal. It's people that you have opened yourself up to. Their inner circle. For someone to come in and carry out some level of treachery, because Judas pretty much knew what he had on his mind, and uh, of course, before this is all over, Satan makes sure he's on his way, but he knew going into the meal what he was looking to do. This level of treachery to do this during a holy meal, not just a meal, a holy meal. The treachery is just, I don't even know what to compare it to in Western culture. We say stab in the back. I mean, this is someone pretending they're your best friend and hugging you and the knife going in at the same time. The treachery is unimaginable. Ha! Huh. Now let's go back to this. Jesus washed how many feet? All of them, including Judas. As this is happening, he knows the level of betrayal. So you see, you've got two things going on. The level of the servanthood, which is just mind-boggling, and the level of the betrayal. Almost impossible for the human mind to put together. Uh, as I was reading this... Um, I got thinking of Pastor Tim. Now, for most of us around here, Pastor Tim is one of our heroes out there that we like to support when we can. And Pastor Tim, a lot of us remember, I think there was nothing more fun than bringing Kevin Kendall down to an inner city dinner. It was just fun watching your face, Kev. You're just taking it all in. But he dealt with some pretty hard folks there where he was. You weren't talking about some broken individuals. And in order to do church work, guess what you have to do? Let them into your meal. And there was one young man they were lifting up and trying to help. Turns out, was talking to Tim later, he had stolen $2,000 worth of equipment out of their sanctuary. Equipment doesn't come easy to an inner city church. Imagine, someone helping you out at that level and you steal $2,000 worth of their equipment. And Tim really, uh, I don't know how he worked all of it out, but talk about a man who took it with a lot of grace and moved on. That's the kind of foot washing servanthood that Jesus is telling you about. You know, it's wonderful if people want to do foot washing services and whatever. That's not the point. The point isn't to be physically washing feet, it's to take all of what I'm telling you 
All of this precept and put it into action in actual everyday life. A foot washing, that level of servants, the servants are, it, it, the world doesn't understand it. And I would dare say that in a lot of churches, you have people who sit and they hear and they go, oh yeah, that's cool, and don't understand it. And you can't really blame them. And this foot washing level of servanthood, the servant's heart, it's so powerful that it can overcome betrayal. It's so powerful that somebody can actively be meaning you harm and you are still able to be at this level of servanthood. If that doesn't blow you away, then maybe this will. That's your example. If you are going to have any part in Christ, this is what you're called to. Hmm. Sounds ridiculous, doesn't it? How do you turn something like that around? Well, let's start with even, is it worth it? How does it, before we get there, let's just talk about, is it worth it? Does it, you know, is it worth the effort? Let's go back to Peter for a moment. Imagine you are Peter. You think you are hot stuff. The moment you get put under test, you deny everything you knew, even with bad words. You deny you even know Christ. How would that affect you for the rest of your life when you thought you were so in tune? I think for me, it would scar me for the rest of my life. I mean, that level of failure, I'd, I'd never, never believe in myself again or what I might do, but that would have been Peter, except there was a risen Christ who restored him. And we know where Peter ends up in the full amount. He becomes the one who leads the first church. What a difference. Judas craved to have wealth. He craved to be set up comfortable for life. And he was. He's calculating out, I think, of the, that 30 pieces of silver, I think it was 47 grams per coin. It came out to something like $100,000. But anyway, he had this wealth. And how does it turn? It, he should have had everything he wanted. There it was. He, he had the wealth. He had the place. He had Life was made. He had it. But the guilt was so crushing, the same guilt that Peter had, only magnified, it was so heavy on him that what does he do with the coins? He throws them back in the face of those who give them. Threw, the, threw it away, threw it on the ground. Why the, He was crushed by his own guilt. He was just crushed and couldn't go on, so his life ends up in suicide. How about Jesus? Well, because Peter was self-centered in the way that he was self-preservation. He denied the Lord so he wouldn't have to die. Judas was selfish because he was setting himself up at Christ's expense. It didn't work out well for either one of them. So how about Jesus? Here's a line to blow you away. In 31, while this is going on, it says, when, that is Judas, had gone out, Jesus said, now is the Son of Man glorified. What a weird thing to say, isn't it? You know you're about to have somebody drive a knife in your back and you go, now I will be glorified. And God is glorified in him. If God is glorified in him, God will also glorify him in himself and glorify him at once. The original in the Greek, the word glorify means to extol, to celebrate, to honor, to adorn with luster to give great renown, to give dignity or acknowledgement. Pretty positive, pretty amazing stuff. This is what was going to go on. So Jesus was saying, as the very worst thing was happening, hmm, how would you feel knowing you're in the position that somebody's going to betray you so bad you're not even going to live for the rest of the week? That sounds like a low point to me. I would say that's a bad day. 
And Jesus is saying, no, now's the time to be glorified. There was this way that he realized that God's plan was still unfolding. To be glorified is to be brought into full light, to be brought into full light for all eternity. This is what's going on. Even as it seemed dark in the moment that this is failure happening, the foot washing was going on and the servanthood was going on. Jesus saw it as a victory. An amazing thing. Maybe all of this brings uh, something he said earlier to mind that's really hard to understand. Luke 9.24 says, For whoever would save his life will lose it. Maybe when we look at Judas and Peter in this moment, maybe we understand what that part means. But whoever loses his life for myself will save it. Maybe Jesus knew what was actually going on here. For what does it profit a man? What does it profit me? What does it profit you if we gain the whole world and lose or forfeit our own selves? What do we actually gain? Two important things. I just want to pull out real quick on how it is that you can be this kind of servant and see, uh, see your way through this level of dark hour. One, he was connected to the Father. He didn't lose track of what the Father was really doing. It's amazing if you can keep your eye on the end game. Even for this place, what does this place matter except for where the end game is going? And that's to the Father. And the only people that can see the end game, the only people who can stay in step and have this kind of power are those who are in the relationship. And those in the relationship uh, are those who have clean feet. And they have clean feet because they're routinely washing. They do something else. They wash each other's feet as well. How do you find your life? You find it by giving it away. How do you find your life? By washing feet. How do you find yourself? By washing the feet of others. Now here's the disclaimer though. See, this is a wonderful, powerful thing, but you can't do it. It is impossible. I, I, I just disclaimer, do not go home and try this. Say, what, what happened at the sermon today? Well, found out that I'm not supposed to do what Jesus said. Yep, except there's a, there's a vignette to it. The thing is, it's impossible for you as a human being for me to do it. I'm just being honest. If we go out and try and wash feet like it's being laid out here, we will end up miserable and frustrated. You will not succeed. Because at some point, you will hit something that it's just too much and you'll feel defeated and it's all over. And it would be all over except for the Lord picking you up. Here's how we do. Because see, there's another worse part of this is because not only can you not do it, God says you must do it. You will not see the kingdom of heaven unless you do this. But I can't, that's right. So what happened? Let me take you through a small flurry of texts. John 14, 12. Truly, truly, I say to you, Whoever believes in me will also do the works that I do and greater works than these will he do because I am going to the Father, which we know happens. Whatever you ask in my name, I will do that the Father may be glorified in the Son. There's the living relationship. If you ask anything in my name, I will do it. John 15.1 I am the true vine. And my Father is the vine dresser. Every branch that is where? In me. Every branch that is in me that does not bear fruit, he takes away. And every branch that does bear fruit, he prunes that it may bear more fruit. Already you are clean because of the word. Your feet are clean because of the word that I have spoken to you. Abide where? In me. And I in you. John 14, 16, I will ask the Father and he will give you another helper to be with you forever, even the spirit of truth 
whom the world cannot receive because it neither sees him nor knows him. Yeah, we've been around that block a few times. You know him for he dwells with you and will be where? In you. In, 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 in you. You are in me, I am in you. The only way it works for you to consistently live the nature of Christ is for Christ to be in you. It doesn't work any other way. If you believe, that's wonderful. But unless this person of Christ, this power, this entity, this presence of Christ is in you or me, we will do some bad stuff and just put religious talk to it. The thing that makes the difference is in you. In me. Powerful chapter. And you know what? It all comes down to one statement. Here's that, you know, the truth we talked about, that we had the two opposites in the truth. I have given you an example. I have given you an example. I have given you an example that you also should do just as I have done to you question then becomes, after you look at this crazy level of foot-washing servanthood, to that level, are you really ready to follow the example? And if you say yes, oh, wonderful, the next question then becomes, okay, how do you expect to do it? How do you expect to pull it off? You know him, for he dwells with you and will be where? There's your answer. There's your answer.